Welcome to the Queen Anne's County Board of Education meeting. May I have a motion to go into closed session? Motion to a move to closed session as permitted by Section 3-305B of the General Provision Article of the Annotated Code of Maryland. I move that we go into closed session to discuss administrative items that include minutes from September 6th and September 20th, personnel matters to include the HR report, and a consult with counsel. May I have a second? Second. Second. Open session reconvenes. Mm -mm. At six o'clock. Mm -mm. mm -mm. That's not you. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. She has to do the eye. Okay. With May I have a second? I have a second. I have a second. Okay. I second it. Thank you. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. We will return at 6 p.m. Welcome to the Board of Queen, the Board of Education meeting for Queen Anne's County. This is a public meeting that is being videotaped for county citizens to review on QHC TV 7, a local cable station. The agenda is available on the information table. During this meeting, we ask that you turn off your cell phones and hold personal conversations outside of the meeting room. We will now be led in the Pledge of Allegiance by our student board members, Sarah Schauber and Grace Parks. Please stand. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, <clears throat> At this time, the board would like to observe a moment of silence for the Las Vegas massacre. For those who may not be aware, on Monday, September 18th, we lost our school board president and our dear friend, Bishop Arlene Taylor. Bishop Arlene Faye Taylor was born March 25th, 1962 in Baltimore, Maryland. Bishop Taylor was raised in Graysonville, Maryland. She received her education in Queen Anne's County School System. Upon the completion of her high school tenure. In 1980, she attended Chesapeake College and later the Computer Communications Institution in Wilmington, Delaware. She was later employed in the Queen Anne's County, working with alternative students in Sellersville and Stevensville schools. She remained dedicated to her work as Queen, Queen Anne's County School Board member, where she was diligent in equal opportunity for the residents of Queen Anne's County. She moved back to Graysonville in 1989, immediately took to the street to share her testimony of deliverance. She founded the group Youth in Action at that time. Under this title, she organized field trips, a softball team, an anti-drug march, a biographical play entitled Cracking Up on Crack. In 1991, she received the governor's citation in, in recognition of impressive commitment to the people of Queen Anne's County as demonstrated by her dedicated efforts and vision in effectively addressing the problem of substance abuse and particularly in her noteworthy contributions in prevention. In 1994, under the tutelage of her mother, she answered the call to preach the gospel. By 1995, she was ordained evangelist <coughs> in the Mount Sinai Holy Church of America. She also held a four-year term as vice president of the National Youth Convention of the Mount Sinai Holy Church of America. She then labored in God's vineyard, preaching the gospel, and many lives were changed. In 1996, she was ordained as an elder, continuing her faithful service. She established herself as a respected woman of God in the community, church, legal, and school systems. Judges, attorneys, and principals alike all honor Reverend Taylor. In 1997, she founded the 4-H National Women's Conference in which women from five states gathered to the Holiday Inn in Annapolis, Maryland. On July 5, 1998, Bishop Taylor gave birth to the Vision and Chosen Generation Deliverance Ministry was born. On October 1st, 2005, Chosen Generation held its first annual fall conference and stepping out gala where Bishop Taylor was ordained overseer of Chosen Generation Deliverance Ministries. In the fullness of time, God saw fit to take Bishop Taylor into a new territory, receiving an associate's degree from the National School of Theology. Promotion to the office of Bishop in 2014 
president of the Queen Anne's County Board of Education, which she ser served until her passing. And on a more personal note, I have many fond memories of Arlene and will always admire her dedication and commitment to helping anyone in need. Arlene could not save everyone she met, but nothing would stop her from trying to. It was her goal in this life to help others, to help them become better people, better in their health and personal lives, better in their families, better in their careers, and better in their communities. She may not have always been successful, but she always tried. That is her legacy, and it is a beautiful legacy to leave. And she will truly be remembered for that. So thank you for that time. And we will now move on for the approval of the agenda. I make a motion that we approve the agenda. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. The ayes have it. Approval of the minutes, open and closed sessions for September 6th and September 20th. I make a motion that we approve the minutes from open and closed sessions September 6th and 20th. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. The ayes have it. And at this time, you get to listen to me read again. Um, this is for the Open Meetings Compliance Board. Opinion of the Open Meetings Compliance Board meeting of the Board of Education, Queen Anne's County, um, today. Maryland's Open Meeting Act is a statute that requires many state and local public bodies to hold their meetings in public, to give the public adequate notice of those meetings, and to allow the public to inspect meeting minutes. The act also permits public bodies to discuss some topics confidentially with proper documentation. The act's central goals are to increase the public's faith in government, ensure the accountability of government to the public, and enhance the public's ability to participate effectively in our democracy. Members of public bodies are supposed to be familiar with the act's requirements, and recent legislation has increased opportunities for training. Under this law, there's a three-member Open Meetings Compliance Board which issues advisory opinions in response to written complaints about alleged violations of the Act. Although the Compliance Board is not part of the Office of the Attorney General, citizens can find a lot of excellent and detailed information about the law on the Attorney General's website. This includes copies of the Compliance Board's opinion. While the opinions of the Compliance Board are only advisory, and it has no authority to imp impose penalties, they offer guidance to help public officials approve their open meetings practice. Along these lines, several complaints were lodged in early 2016, alleging that our Board of Education had fallen short of the Act's requirements for giving notices of meetings, following procedures for closing meetings, and disclosing necessary information after meetings. The Compliance Board consolidated the complaints and, in opinion issued last May, found that there had been some violations. By law, we are required to announce this to the public and offer a summary of the opinion. The Compliance Board's first finding was that the school board did not provide reasonable advance notice of meetings in February and March of 2016 when it posted the fact of a closed session board meeting without specifying the meeting location and without inviting the public to observe the open session vote. They also found that while the school system had a number of places on its website that provided meeting information, the format, detail, and chronology were inconsistent. Thus, the Compliance Board advised that public bodies who post website notices temporarily should also keep record of the dates on which they post their notices. The second finding was that in two incidents, the board voted in closed session to hold a closed meeting, but the law requires that any vote to close a meeting must take place during the public portion of the meeting. A third concern involved written closing statements that lacked sufficient detail. A public body may not meet in closed session until the presiding officer not only has conducted a vote on a motion to close, but also has prepared a written statement of the basis for the closing. The written statement must disclose three items of information, the statutory authority for the closed session, the topics to be discussed, and the reason for closing. The Compliance Board recommend, recommended that any motion to close should expressly state all of the information on the closing statement. This helps assure the public that, no, that the members have knowingly voted the state, stated basis for why they are meeting behind closed doors. 
Lastly, the board found that while the minutes of the February 10th, 2016 open session contain a summary of the closed meeting held that day, they did not provide a summary of the closed session held the day before. In addition, other summaries or statements around the time period lack sufficient detail. The board offered forms and worksheets, which we now use. As I mentioned earlier, the full opinion can be found on the Attorney General's website. It's listed as 10 <coughs> OMCD <coughs> Opinion 35 2016. Please know that this board takes its open meeting meetings obligation seriously. Over the past year, we believe we have improved our procedures and practices and that our public notices, our web-based content, our video services all support an open, inviting, and accessible forum for governing our school system. At the same time, we will keep improving by updating our forms and other technical de details, participating in training, and listening to your suggestions. Thank you. Uh, so at this time, we're going to move on to our recognitions. Dr. Kane, would you like to lead us through the recognitions? I certainly would. So we'll take our places. Let you go. <laughs> so we have three recognitions this evening. Uh, the first recognition goes to the Difference Maker Award, and that is Shannon Atkinson. Shannon Atkinson is the reading specialist at Kent Island High School Annex. Would you stand, please? There she is. Okay. This recognition is nominated by Crystal Chambers, the assistant principal at Kent Island High School Annex. According to Ms. Chambers, Ms. Atkinson is a talented educator who makes a huge difference by working to close the achievement gap. Oftentimes, Ms. Atkinson finds that her students have struggled with academics, so she works diligently to help them achieve grade level reading. Ms. Atkinson is a teacher dedicated to helping students reach and, ach and achieve their grade level reading. She differentiates her approach to meet their individual needs, which is a functional, I'm sorry, a foundational part of her educational paradigm. As a reading specialist for struggling readers, she develops or she helps them identify with the required academic standards, and she also provides creative options for students to develop content mastery. By doing so, she helps her students get excited about learning. By providing various opportunities for students to develop personal connections to reading and a love of learning, Ms. Atkinson has made a strong, positive impact on countless numbers of students. So please join me in congratulating Ms. Shannon Atkinson. Please come forward. Thank you. Next is the Hero Award, and this very special Hero Award goes to Caitlin Kreidler. Caitlin is a ninth grade student at Kent Island High School Annex. Please stand. There she is. This award is also nominated by Ms. Crystal Chambers. Assistant Principal at Kent Island High School Annex. Now, according to Ms. Chambers, Caitlin always stands up for what's right. She speaks out against injustice towards others. She sticks up for the little guy who, constant and who constantly endures the disrespect of bullies, and she does not tolerate anything less than respect. She's always willing to help her classmates with any situation. Every day, Caitlin commits unselfish acts of kindness and makes our school community a better place. And for that, she is a true hero. Please join me in congratulating Caitlin. Caitlin. 
Brooklyn Criddler. <laughs> Dr. Jane Turner, mom. By all means, is this mom? Now, our third award is going to be presented by Mr. Wayne Humphreys and Chip Brittingham. So please come forward. It is the Energizer Bunny Award. And this award is given to Mr. Chuck Handley, Handy, who is the lead custodian at Stevensville Middle School. Mr. Handy, please stand. There he is. Now, this recognition is nominated by Mr. Sid Pender, our Director of Operations. According to Mr. Pender, Mr. Handy was hired as a lead custodian this past summer, 2017. He has worked tirelessly to ensure that Stevensville Middle School is pristine both inside and out. He jumped in and helped when other custodians were out of the building and worked many, many hours in overtime. The Stevensville Middle School Back to School Night was a huge success and attended by many families. And thanks to Mr. Handley, Handy, along with the custodial team, the building never looked better. Mr. Handy continues to work throughout the day and evening to ensure that the building is clean and now also serves as a Partners for Youth PFY coach and student mentor. He is a valuable asset to Stevensville Middle School and I dare say Queen Anne's County Public Schools in general. So congratulations to Mr. Handy. Please come forward. <laughs> Great job. Do you know how hard these are to get? And he's only here for what, six months or something? Well, he's been here longer than that. Oh, he's, he's, that he's put he's on that position. Six months. Okay. Yes. Congratulations. Take good care of it. It's a little frisky. You're right here. You spent all the time. You spent all the time. Smile. Thank you. Yep. <laughs> okay. Am I reading this? Do you when you read this, do we start up here? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Let's change the word. Do you want to announce what we're doing? Well, no, I guess we have to move on to community involvement. Board members, board members, would you highlight any of your community involvement over the past month? Who wants to start? I'll start. Um, I was able to attend the Kerwin's Commission at Stevensville Middle School, and yes, I agree, it looked like a beautiful school. I was so impressed. I hadn't been in there in a while, and I'm impressed with all of our schools. We should take great pride in the buildings that we have in this county that are um, available for the utilization of this community. We are very, very blessed. I was able to attend um, two showings of Chasing the Dragon. I was able to attend um, something else, but I can't seem to quite remember it. Teach, I was teacher oh, of the our leader funeral, oh, wow. uh, Bishop Taylor's our funeral, which was um, an unfortunate community event, but it was attended by, I would guess, about 700 people. Um, she was very well respected in this community, and we will miss her dearly, so... That was what I did this month. And I think you were also at the Teacher of the Year. I was uh, new at teacher, the New Teacher mm -hmm. um, Welcome Harris's. and the Teacher of the Year um, gift giving that the yes. Chamber put on. Yes, yes, I forgot that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
It's hard to follow Sharon. <laughs> <laughs> um, I attended some school activities. Um, the Tournament of the Bands at uh, Queen Anne's County High School, which was an amazing event. So much talent. Um, <coughs> as well as a North Bay information night to learn about nor what North Bay is going on. Also, um, Reverend Taylor's um, passing and her funeral, which was the most beautiful event. Um, and Friday, I will be attending the Hall of Fame for the, ath for the athletes. So, I will also be there with you. And um, I also attended Bishop Taylor's um, funeral. And um, I have started up in North County. We have started the, uh, we're getting ready to start the uh, Backpack Friday program again. And um, working in both schools. So that's it for me. <laughs> that's plenty. Beverly? <laughs> um, I, I attended the um, first legislative meeting of the um, Maryland Associations of Boards of Ed on September 18th. One of the key, the key main thing we had there was Mr. Bob Gorrell, the director of public school construction. He's new in the state doing that. There's several things he discussed, and I wanted to make sure the public understood them when we're trying to go forward with um, uh, school construction projects. He talked about uh, things that are important to him from his experience. He came from New Mexico in uh, the same position. For him, quality is key. <coughs> key. I'm saying some of this for our um, construction people so they understand some words out of his mouth. Um, he's not big on lead schools um, if the cost ends up higher than uh, it should be. Um, when constructing facilities, he doesn't like things built with wow additions to them, so be aware of that. Um, he also said we need to be mindful of the impact of the, cap of the capital budget on the operating budget, and we ran into that situation when we were able to, by capital budget, purchase all the computers, um, but the follow-on operating budget cost kept growing and growing, so he's, he says we need to be obviously more aware of that. Um, he also is a big believer in adequate. <laughs> Great job. Do you know how hard these are to get? And he's only here for what, six months or something? Well, he's been here longer than that. Oh, he yeah. took yeah. on that position. Six okay. Months. Yes. Congratulations. Take good care of it. Thank you. Stay frisky. Right here. Center of the I guess we have to move on to community involvement. Board members, board members, would you highlight any of your community involvement over the past month? Who wants to start? I'll start. Um, I was able to attend the Kerwin's Commission at Stevensville Middle School, and yes, I agree, it looked like a beautiful school. I was so impressed. I hadn't been in there in a while. And I'm impressed with all of our schools. We should take great pride in the buildings that we have in this county that are um, available for the utilization of this community. We are very, very blessed. I was able to attend um, two showings of Chasing the Dragon. I was able to attend um, something else, but I can't seem to quite remember it. Teach, I was teacher oh, of the our year. funeral, oh, well. uh, Bishop Taylor's our funeral, which was. Um, an unfortunate community event, but it was attended by, I would guess, about 700 people. Um, she was very well respected in this community and we will miss her dearly. So that was what I did this month. And I think you were also at the Teacher of the Year. I was uh, new at teacher. the New Teacher mm -hmm. um, Welcome Harris's. and the Teacher of the Year um, gift giving that the yes. Chamber put on. Yes, yes, I forgot that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Hard to follow, Sharon. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
I attended some school activities, um, the Tournament of the Bands at uh, Queen Anne's County High School, which was an amazing event, so much talent, um, <coughs> as well as a North Bay information night to learn about nor what North Bay is going on. Also, um, Reverend Taylor's um, passing and her funeral, which was the most beautiful event. Um, and Friday, I will be attending the Hall of Fame for the, ath for the athletes. So. I will also be there with you. And um, I also attended Bishop Taylor's um, funeral. And um, I have started up in North County. We have started the, uh, we're getting ready to start the uh, Backpack Friday program again. And um, working in both schools. So that's it for me. <laughs> that's plenty. Beverly? <laughs> um, I, I attended the. Um, first legislative meeting of the um, Maryland Associations of Boards of Ed on September 18th. One of the key, the key main thing we had there was Mr. Bob Goral, the director of public school construction. He's new in the state doing that. There's several things he discussed and I wanted to make sure the public understood them when we're trying to go forward with um, uh, school construction projects. He talked about uh, things that are important to him from his experience. He came from New Mexico in uh, the same position. For him, quality is key. <coughs> key. I'm saying some of this for our um, construction people so they understand some words out of his mouth. Um, he's not big on lead schools um, if the cost ends up higher than uh, it should be. Um, when constructing facilities, he doesn't like things built with wow additions to them, so be aware <coughs> of that. Um, he also said we need to be mindful of the impact of the, cap of the capital budget on the operating budget. And we ran into that situation when we were able to, by the capital budget, purchase all the computers. Um, but the follow-on operating budget cost kept growing and growing. So he's, he says we need to be obviously more aware of that. Um, he also is a big believer in adequ adequacy standards. Um, his thought is that if we have common measures of standards for our buildings and our renovations, that takes away a little bit of the political influence, and that is true, I believe. Um, if we're going to build something, we need to make it as big as possible, since we'll be having it for a long time. Of course, I'm sure that's within the cost uh, restrictions. His priorities are planning and maintenance, and he looks at pricing with the emphasis on how it affects the delivery of education. He spoke about that a few times. So as we're trying to defend some of our construction um, things with the state, to the state, these are things that he considers important. And finally, how construction and renovation have direct threats to life, safety, and health. And he wants to improve on things in our system that he thinks add value, not just make changes for change sake. Um, I just um, got back from the Ocean City um, at the beginning of the MABE conference, which is attended by all 14, I mean, uh, yeah, all 14, um, I'm sorry, all 24 state, uh, state boards of ed, uh, Maryland State Boards of Ed. Most of them have several um, attendees from the boards of ed. I'm the only one representing us, but I think I'm going to try to get some more participation next year from our board. It's really interesting. You do a lot of networking. You do a lot of, um, you really understand and learn from people um, what they're doing in other boards of ed. I think it's very valuable for us um, to, to learn these. And they also have good training sessions. We had two speakers this morning. One of them was um, a gentleman that was speaking on um, methods and ideas about closing the achievement gap which is, a, is an issue going on throughout the country, not just in our county or just in the state of Maryland. Um, and then the other speaker was the state superintendent, Dr. Salmon, and she gave an overview of the state issues. Um, I am returning after this meeting back to Ocean City because I have to attend a seven in the morning legislative breakfast um, meeting um, to bring back more legislative issues for the board on the next meeting. Um, um, did you want to share? No? Well, they go there. Well, they'll have their own. Yeah, they have yeah, their own. Okay. Yeah. All right, so, so I'm, I'm happy <laughs> to up. share, absolutely. So uh, I will also be at the Hall of Fame um, dinner on Friday night. I attended the Kent Island High School homecoming this past week. It was great. 
um, and very, very well attended. My first one, obviously, for the district. Last week, I had the opportunity to participate in Challenge Day at Queen Anne's High School. And that was a really, really interesting and exciting day. For those who may not know, Challenge Day is an experiential, social, emotional learning type of a program where students have an opportunity to address some common issues that high school students might, like cliques and rumors and, and bullying, negative judgments, um, isolation, and that sort of thing. So that created a nice, safe form. Forum. It was led by two fabulous facilitators, and there were many, many volunteers from our school district and uh, administrators also from Queen Anne's High School that were there. So that was a wonderful, um, wonderful opportunity for our students to participate, and it really helped to promote a positive school climate. So all those students got to go back to their schools and, and share something positive. Also, I visited Chester Y Center in Graysonville, and I will be taking my team back to join, um, to take a tour of that facility and really talk about some ways that we might be able to partner with them. Chester Y Center is a program that really enhances the lives of adults with developmental disabilities. Um, and there is a day program and a residential program, so we will be getting involved with partnering with them. This week brought more opportunities to engage with the community. I had an opportunity to meet with Mr. Bill Baxter and, and his team, and, and we discussed ways that we might be able to get our students involved in a, a writing project that other districts in Maryland are a part of. It has to do with <laughs> multicultural um, experiences, and, and it really is worldwide. Right now, there is a group from Kenya that's coming to do performances at different locations throughout Maryland. There have been artists from China and, and several other uh, places around the world. Just a great opportunity to expose our children to some multicultural um, um, events and, and some opportunities to <coughs> learn about other cultures. So that is a great opportunity for us. I also had an opportunity to meet with Krista Pettit from Haven Ministries, and she gave me lots of information about resources and services that they provide. Last year, we had 31 families that were able to be supported from Haven Ministries, and we will continue to find ways to support their efforts and partner with them. <coughs> This morning, I had an opportunity to meet with a group of business people, Linda Friday from the Chamber and Tom Ryder from the Department of Labor Licensing and Regulations. They put together a group of folks who were, we had our commissioner, um, uh, Jack Wilson was there, Chris Garvey from ABC um, Associated Building Contractors, Lucy Hughes, Rita Michael from uh, Chesapeake Community College different electricians and folks that are in the construction trades were there and they talked with us about ways that we might be able to engage our students in these opportunities for apprenticeship programs. So Maryland is looking to build apprenticeship programs and we are very much interested in ensuring that we're preparing our students through the correct CTE pathways to fulfill those uh, workforce demand issues. And there is quite a demand for the construction trades. Students um, have an opportunity to do everything from electrical, plumbing, masonry, all kinds of construction trades. And we want to get our students out in the community so that they can take advantage of those programs. And then in turn, those businesses can help us to ensure that the curricula that we offer is aligned with workforce needs, workforce demand. So that was an awesome opportunity. And, and P.S. Uh, to parents who may be listening, no student loans involved. So <laughs> it, was a, it was a great great opportunity and we're really excited about uh, participating there. So uh, I will also be attending uh, MABE, so I, I will go once this meeting is over, head on over to, the, uh, to Ocean City and, and participate in those uh, opportunities to continue to learn. Thank you. Yes. At this time we're going to move on to mm -hmm. stu student board member reports. <coughs> Who wants to go first? You can I'll go. <laughs> okay. Um, so, Ken Island High School just had our homecoming festivities this past weekend, and we won our football game 31 to 19 against Par Parkside High School. On October 11th, underclassmen will be taking the PSAT, and that night the band and choir will have a performance starting at 7 p.m. Unity Day is on October 25th, and we will be participating by wearing the Unity Day t shirts. And our fall play, Check Please, opens on Thursday, October 26th at 3 p.m. And there's also a performance on Friday, October 27th at 7 p.m. 
All right. So Queen Anne's County High School will be holding its homecoming events, including a parade, football game, and dance this Saturday, October 7th. Queen Anne's County High School Regional SGA Branch is aiming to host a general assembly in the winter of 2018, which invites middle and high schools from Talbot, Caroline, and Queen Anne's County to participate in numerous workshops and activities to build leadership skills at Queen Anne's County High School. Today, my SGA president, Sabrina Rush, is also here today to read you a letter, so you'll get to hear from her later. thought I'd give her a little bit of an introduction. Thank you. Thank you, ladies. Chairman? Citizens' participation is next, and it's an opportunity for our public to comment. Is there anyone who would like to speak at this time? If so, come forward and state your name, and Jen will read your um, instructions. Um, we ask that speakers keep in mind the following guidelines. Speakers should sign the roster, including their telephone number and address. Comments should be limited to two minutes in length. Comments longer than two minutes should be submitted in writing. Questions or statements to the board should relate to a recent agenda item. An agenda item that is expected to appear in the future or a matter of general policy over the board over which the board has authority. Please do not discuss items related to negotiations. Those items are to be discussed at the bargaining table. This is not a proper avenue to address specific student or employee personnel matters, especially those matters on legal appeal, on legal appeal to the board. Comments about, about the actions or statements of the individual staff members are not appropriate for public comments and should be referred to the superintendent of schools or processed through available, the available channels. Citizen participation is not intended to be a question and answer session. If you have specific questions, the board will make appropriate staff member respond to the questions at a later date. The board respects your desire and right to convey your message freely, but asks as a courtesy to the board and our citizens that you respect the board's request to refrain from naming citizens and name calling when offering your critique. The per first person on the list is, um, and excuse me if I pr mispronounce your name, Micah Galberth. I should have done a little pronunciation <laughs> for it, you I know how hard that Thank is. Thank you. Okay. Is this the microphone? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Hi, everyone. Hi. Hello. Good evening to our board members and Superintendent Kane. My name is Mika Galbraith. Sorry that I didn't help you out there. Thank you. <laughs> I'm a Graysonville Elementary School. I'm in Stevensville Middle School parent and an active PTA member and school volunteer. I have come to this evening's board meeting to offer public comment regarding the future of our elementary school librarians. Um, along with the other parents at our schools, um, I was you know, alarmed and concerned at the end of last school year when it seemed that our school librarians were potentially going to be reassigned back to the traditional classroom positions and the school librarians' responsibilities shifted to non-licensed um, school support staff positions in order to address some of our budgetary concerns at the time. I'd first like to thank all of you and um, the leadership of our school district um, for, um, let's see, I should have worn my glasses. <laughs> I'm just getting used to readers, so I haven't quite identified go. when need I need them. <laughs> Mine we are all prescription. have them. We all have them. They're not prescription. They're just readers I'm, if you want to. I've been wearing them around on my head, and I'm just, I can't quite um, get to the point where I know when I'm going to need them and what I can read with and without them. So forgive me for a minute. I'm going to have to use my tracking skills along my remarks. Um, so anyway, I would first like to thank all of you again for finding the resources to keep our school library programs intact for this school year. After 11 years of being part of Queen Anne's County Public Schools and being very active and involved with the school community, this is, um, I've never seen another issue unite um, advocacy in our parents and, and our staff at, uh, at my um, children's schools as this issue did. Um, so I'm here today because as the school district officials and our board um, move forward with working on next year's school budget, I would like for you to keep a few considerations about our school <coughs> library programs at the forefront of your minds. Um, it is my hope that you will not even have to bring forward the removal of school librarians as an option in the future. I certainly empathize with the budgeting <coughs> task ahead for all of you. Overall, our schools and students need a lot more money and not less. And we shouldn't even have to have this conversation, and I wish instead I was sitting before you lobbying you for how we were going to spend additional funding that we had um, rather than reducing it, because I know there really is nothing that can be cut um, that doesn't directly impact our students. So I know the challenge is hard. Um, I have worn many hats um, in education over the last 20 years. Um, I sit before you tonight as a parent, but I have also experience 
um, in Las Vegas, actually. I worked for Clark County School District for 10 years um, as an educator there in schools and central office. And then I've also been involved with um, writing curriculum and helping organizations and nonprofits bring things to school districts. So I have a little bit of a perspective of educational standards and professional development needs in the pulse of the nation. Um, as, as far as educational issues are concerned. So my goal tonight was to share five reasons with you that kind of were an inter intersection of a lay person and a parent perspective and an educator um, perspective as well as a concerned citizen who's not employed in any way in Queen Anne's County Public Schools but brings that to the table too. So, um, so anyway, here are my reasons and things that I think that you should keep in mind when you're thinking about the library and positions in our school library programs over this um, next uh, couple of months. First, uh, the, the idea is management. Our school librarians are, of course, educators, but in addition to that, they serve in quasi-administrative responsibilities at the, their schools. They deal with budgeting, they deal with ordering, they deal with policies, they deal with procedures, and it's a, it's a skill set that they need to have to do that. Is that my two-minute warning? Okay, I'm going to go faster. Um, the second is uh, student achievement. Our, our, our school librarians are integral to student achievement. They work not only towards standards that they have to teach to and be accountable, for that are nationally based standards but they help support our English language arts curriculum in pretty much any curriculum area that there is curriculum for so in other words these are our school librarians don't just have to be responsible for their own standards and not just standards of a specific grade level that a classroom teacher might know who teaches third grade they have to know the gamut of all the standards that are out there and that also takes the specialized training and knowledge and education that is behind that license that they have to hold that position so I think it's important to keep in mind um, there our, our school librarians are givers they collaborate with everyone at the school not just their classroom teachers, but also their um, specialists that work with them, our PE teacher, our music teachers, our art teachers, our technology teachers, they all work together all year long. They do things that are a part of the library program, but they also help with our school talent shows and our school events and our field days. And that is something that is very apparent in any time that I've ever watched a school librarian from this school district to um, anywhere else in the country as well. Um, and the, my fourth point is illumination. This is a word I hope you'll remember. I think that it's really important that we illuminate and elevate the role of our education support professionals in our school district. Um, this is important and, and also a national trend that's going on. Um, I have the utmost, resport, uh, utmost respect in, uh, for our educator support professionals, education support professionals also um, known as ESPs. Uh, this is a category where our classroom assistants who may take on the role or a para or who may take on the role of that library position. Um, I think that you have to keep in mind that when thinking about elevating their roles, um, what does it say to that education support professional when you're saying, here is the librarian's responsibility, and you're going to do it all now, and you're going to not only teach a curriculum and these standards, but all of the logistical aspects that go along with managing our school library, and you're going to do it all and be expected to do everything that certified position accomplished, and on top of it, we're you know, your salary that you get for that job and doing the same responsibilities of that other person is a, a fraction of what they receive. I think that when, when you look at what the responsibilities of a librarian are and the person who you take to fill that job um, and cut a salary and expect them to do the same things, that that has a fallout effect in the way our school district is viewed. It can affect recruitment. It can affect morale. It can affect the school culture. And I think that it, our school district would be in a better position if we are elevating every role and every position um, that work with and, and serve our children. So, and lastly, of course, um, they are librarians cultivate a love for learning. And I read something actually just today that was um, that said that the number one thing you can do to harm reading and achievement and instruction is to kill a kid's love of learning. So, I mean, that is the center of what our school librarians do. And it's the tip of the iceberg. They get kids to love books, but beneath that, there are all these things they know how to do that are special skills that you may not even know they have, like understand that curriculum, assess kids' needs, and order our books and keep our technology up to date. And all all those important um, aspects so I took my own love for my school library program where I was really big on poetry in elementary school and those um, five points that I just uh, referenced to you make an sort of an acro acrostic poem that spells out magic so keep the magic in our library program and please 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 moving forward think about our school librarians and the role they play and how essential it is to student achievement and thank you for your time I'm sorry I went over the time 
I didn't see a time requirement or I would have provided written um, copies so that when you beat that would have been done. Thank you very much. Thank have you. a good yeah. night. Thank you. Um, next on the list is Richard McNeil. I get two and a half minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I said a bad precedent. <laughs> good evening. Richard McNeil, uh, president of the uh, Retired Educators Association uh, of the county. <laughs> and uh, we express our condolences to the community and to the board for the passing of uh, Bishop Taylor. Um, one thing uh, we'd like to uh, say to you, everybody, we appreciate the work that you do in, uh, for the school system. A lot of our members, uh, as you well know, have uh, put their life into the schools and helping children, whatever capacity that might be. And, um, you know, we do appreciate the hard work that you all do. And I know that our members are continuing, many of them are continuing to work by volunteering in the school. They go in and read to uh, the uh, young classes and so forth, but they also support uh, a lot of the elementary programs by cutting out things and you know doing all kinds of stuff. So they haven't stopped. Uh, we're right now, we are currently have 169 active members, uh, which might not sound like a whole lot, but uh, that for this county and for the size of it, and for the people who are still living here after they've retired, um, I think we're doing pretty good. Um, we appreciate your continued support of our health care package. Uh, that is very important to uh, members as you retire. And uh, th at one time, the people of the state thought that the state was taking care of that, but that's all local, as you well know. And we appreciate uh, your support on that. Um, Captain Kelly, you mentioned legislative issues. I know that uh, one of the things that I would encourage the board to, in support of that as these issues come up as far as pension is concerned, uh, we appreciate your support at that same level to which we are supporting it. I know that some um, bills came in, were introduced this past year to change for those people who are just coming into the program. And we think that that's not going to be a good thing for down the road uh, as everybody else um, retires and there's less con contribution to that program, then there's going to be less funding for over the long distance. So we appreciate you keeping up to date on that. I know myself, I attend, I will be attending a legislative update issue on November the 10th, which is for our group. Um, on another hand, I'd like to just thank you again for supporting the mentor program. Uh, I've been doing this now for five years since I retired. We have an exciting group of uh, new teachers and uh, I know that the, the, the group that I work with uh, are just doing a dynamic job. They're not perfect, uh, but they're willing to learn. They're, they're easily coached, and uh, just appreciate that. And, and uh, thanks to uh, Janet Pauls for taking over the facilitation of that, and uh, we appreciate her effort on that. I'm also been, will be monitoring the life skill program of our sixth and seventh grade uh, middle school students. I do that through the University of Colorado at Boulder, uh, that program, and uh, so we, we do that. And also, I'd like to commend uh, Sid and uh, Mr. Hardy. I would go to seven to eight schools every day or during the course of a week, and every school that I've been in this year has been absolutely clean, spotless, and open. So thanks to Sid and his leadership and, and so forth on that. And to leave you with a thought for tomorrow when you wake up. Tomorrow when you wake up, well, you will be the oldest you have ever been and yet the youngest that you'll ever be. So enjoy the day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next up is Andrea Neiman. <coughs> Andrea Nyman, but oh, thank you. everyone always says it wrong. I blame Neiman Marcus. They say it wrong. <laughs> um, but thank you, Dr. Keenan, board members. I'm a community member and a librarian um, here speaking also in favor of retaining the professional school library media specialist for the new budget year. Um, I was very grateful to see that you all were able to uh, restore the professional uh, media specialists for this current year. Um, I was one of many community members who spoke out about that. Um, and I was just, but I was disappointed to see that it was explicitly listed as only a one-year guarantee of those positions. Um, 
As a librarian myself, I am strongly opposed to the removal of these professionals from elementary schools. Um, they are critical partners in educating our children, particularly in the 21st century where information overload is all too common and information assessment and literacy are becoming ever more crucial skills. Numerous studies in public schools nationwide have shown that public school media specialists have positive impacts on student learning, achievement, test scores, literacy, and overall teacher effectiveness. They collaborate with and support our hardworking teachers with their curriculum goals and are important partners in students' educational success. Replacing professionals with paraprofessionals is unfortunately um, a common trend that I've witnessed in the larger library world throughout my career. Um, while I've had the great good fortune to work with many excellent paraprofessionals, um, it is unfair to both groups to assume that they are the same. As uh, the previous commenter noted, too often these kinds of changes will result in um, undertrained and highly underpaid paraprofessional staff being expected to maintain these standards of professional certified staff. As I'm sure you know, in the state of Maryland, just like teachers, uh, professional school library media specialists as well as professional public librarians are required to maintain a level of continuing education and an active professional certificate. <coughs> um, I wouldn't imagine that anyone would want to replace all of our uh, certified teachers with paraprofessionals, so I would certainly expect us to not want to do it with our media specialists either. Uh, the expenditure to retain these professionals represents a very small fraction of the board budget, uh, one half of one percent, and I sincerely hope that uh, you're able to find these funds uh, to go forth this year and the years ahead. Um, I really feel very strongly that eliminating these kinds of professionals uh, is a false savings, one that hurts our youngest students and undermines our hardworking teachers. Uh, Queen Anne's County deservedly has an excellent reputation for its public school system. Uh, it's a standout among Eastern Shore counties and it's actually one of the reasons why I moved here. Um, it would be a great shame, I think, to undermine this fantastic system by removing <coughs> a key component of its success. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next on the list is Sabrina Rush. Hello. My name is Sabrina Rush. Um, first, I would like to apologize for my appearance. I wanted to look a bit more professional for you guys. But unfortunately, we had Spirit Week this week, and homecoming preparations have kept us all very busy, so I was unable to do so. Um, I would like to talk to you guys a little bit about student government. Um, in years past, student government participation has been very low, and this past year and current year, student government participation has increased 600%. To continue to grow student involvement, we have partnered with the Maryland Association of Student Councils. Through this partnership, we have been able to attend conferences such as Fall Leadership Conference, Legislative Session, Advocacy Day, and MASC Convention. At these conferences and events, students have gained valuable leadership skills that will aid them throughout their lives. Our attendance at these events is crucial to growing involvement and therefore the student voice. The busing to and from these events have proved to be a challenge financially. Last year, the board so graciously provided us with funding to get busing. Um, and currently this year, the QACHS student government is financing transportation costs for not only the QACHS SGA, but the Centerville Middle School SGA and any other secondary school SGA that will join in the future. In an effort to continue the growth of student leadership in Queen Anne's County, I request on behalf of Queen Anne's County High School student government and the Northern Eastern Shore Association of Student Councils funding to continue to pay for transportation to and from MASC events and other leadership events. Thank you for your time and consideration on this matter. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next on the list is Bob Simons. <coughs> Bob Simmons, thank you. Uh, something I had not planned to ask for until I heard tonight uh, uh, in, in the announcements, and that is to ask that going to the Attorney General's webpage to find out what he said is not easy. Uh, uh, I would like to see us post that on the Queen Anne's County uh, School Board, the full opinion on the Queen Anne's County School Board. Uh, for those who are interested in seeing what it says about the open meeting uh, regulations. Uh, but going to what I did come to talk about in there, uh, that uh, I think that most of you are aware that the legislature has appointed a commission to make recommendations on what to do about changing the direction of education in the state of Maryland if to change it at all. And uh, they have been meeting for eight months. 
with eight different sessions, and it is all recorded and, and available on TV on demand. Uh, you go to certain uh, locations and uh, uh, click the right places on a, on a web page, and it is there. Uh, and I would, it, it's, it's not easy to get to. We, our citizens, need to know about the complexities that go into the education business. They too often think it's just as simple as their mother told them to do, and things aren't the same anymore. It's a very complex subject, and the more we can have educated parents and educated citizens, the better off they will be at understanding what you as school board officials have to come up with and, and have to compromise with and work out to achieve. So I'd uh, recommend that uh, our citizens, uh, it, that directions to that be posted. Uh, I have a letter here that I will give to you board members that uh, tells you how to get there more easily. And it is a situation where I would encourage, uh, I will be encouraging uh, our local TV station to broadcast these so that you don't have to go to the to the state general assembly uh, uh, web page to find them uh, and, and to get them make make them as available to everybody as we can and i would particularly encourage uh, you people and anybody else listening today to go ahead and try to get there and in particular i would recommend the october session where the leader of the group, a uh, higher professional, uh, 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 Mr. Mark, or Dr. Uh, Mark Tucker, who is uh, head of the National Center of Education and, and Economy, uh, gives uh, a, an analysis of what faces the problems that face education today, why we are not among the top five in the world, why we're down in around 30 or 40 somewhere and he analyzes that, and it's the most uh, meaningful uh, synopsis I've seen. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else that would like to speak at this time that didn't get their name on the list? Okay. I wanted this to put a few of these on the table if anybody wants to steal one going out. They're welcome for it. At this time, we're going to move on to presentations. Um, the order presentation by Joanne Crowder from BSC Group LLC. Hello, how are you? <laughs> but you can introduce them. I will. Hey, good evening, everyone. <clears throat> My name's Robin Landgraf. I'm the Chief Financial Officer for the Board of Education. And with me tonight is Joanne Crowder, who is the Audit the Test Practice Leader and a Director of BSC Group, LLC. Um, and behind her, here in the second row, we have Brenda Leith, who was the um, manager on our audit. And then next to her is Karen Bird, who is a Senior Associate. Also, both of those are with BSC Group LLC. So, <clears throat> essentially, um, we have had our, our financial statements audited, which we're required by law to do every year. Um, and Joanne is here to give you a synopsis of what's in those financial statements, how we did, um, how our internal controls were. And I will turn it over mm -hmm. to Joanne from this point. They have copies. Um, it is on, it was online. posted online mm -hmm. okay. uh, along with the um, SAS 114 letter. Oh, okay. That, yeah. what she's referencing the SAS 114 letter, it's kind of a high level overview. Um, it's standard language. It basically tells you uh, what we think might be some of the more important accounting estimates, which I'll get into some of that later. Um, important disclosures, whether or not we had uh, any audit adjustments. Um, so it, it, and it's the same letter you've been receiving every year. The audit package itself, well, before I get into the audit package, the audit was filed timely with the State Department of Education. Um, it was originally due Friday and then they gave it till Monday, yeah, Monday because of the 30th being on a Saturday. So that was done. Uh, internal control, we did not have any findings to report in, in the internal control report that's in the package. Um, if there was any recommendations or discussions, they were handled with Robin or her staff at the time, but nothing that needs to be reported. 
Um, the opinion, as in all years before, is what we call clean opinion, unmodified. Same with the internal control report that's in there. And essentially, within this package, the, the package itself is the same as what you've seen every year. There's no major changes to the contents of the package. And essentially what you have is three sets of books, as we like to say. You have what we call the budget basis, which is your budget every year. Then from there we build into what we call the fund basis, and I'll be touching on different pages within these uh, as we go <coughs> along. And the difference between what we call the budget basis, the fund basis, is really just the timing of op when open purchase orders are recorded as expenditures. And then there's the government-wide, which is more like a commercial business. It gives a long-term view, whereas the budget basis and the fund basis is concerned with the single year and what may be due to be paid within the next year. However, the government-wide goes into more of a long-term view of liabilities and assets. So to start, I want to go to page 14 of the, the financial statements. This is the statement of net position. And this is part of what we call the government-wide, which is the long-term view of, of your assets and liabilities. And as you'll see, down towards the bottom of the page, under the category called net position, there is an unrestricted deficit of approximately $59 million. And that is because when you bring in the, li the long-term liabilities for the, um, the state pension, the allocated portion of your state pension, the capital leases, and the, um, um, the accrued and unpaid leave, and the future oh. liability for the, the retiree health insurance, the o what we call the OPEB. Your undepreciated capital assets this is not at fair market value. This is what you purchased them with their originally con the construction costs or whatever. That's approximately 166 million. So that's your long-term asset that you have there. Then looking at the non-current liabilities, you have that what is due within one year, 565,000, and then due within more than one year. There's your long-term view of 65 million. That 65 million is made up of 57 million, which is the future liability of that retiree health insurance, and that's based on actuarial reports. So you're required to accrue that liability as the people are employed, not just later. Now, on the budget basis, what you budget is what you're going to be paying for the premiums for the next year. Then there's five million dollars that is the allocated portion of the Maryland State Retirement System liability that's not funded. Then there's two and a half million of the uh, long-term commitment for capital leases with Johnson Controls and laptops. And then the uh, accrued and unpaid leave is approximately $863,000. So that's what makes up that 65 million of long-term doing more, more than one year. Now if we go to page, I'm gonna skip all the way back to page 44. And this is, it's note 11 for fund balance. That's always a, an important topic. And for all your various funds, you had a fund balance at the end of the year of 3.9 million. Nine, 900,000 of that was uh, in your construction fund, 40 of uh, the small part for the food service fund. So 2.9 million, almost $3 million was for your, your regular general fund. But out of that, only $817,000 had not been committed to other purposes because you had uh, $264,000 that was budgeted for the current expense budget, $800,000 that's set aside for future insurance costs, $645,000 to help fund that accrued unpaid leave, retirement incentives, and then the encumbrances is the open purchase orders. So they were open as orders at the end of June 30, but then they became expenditures and paid probably in July, August, and maybe a little bit in early September. Um, then going to page 48, this is your budget. So you have your original budget, your final budget, and there was no change in the total budget, but there were some changes in the categories of the expenditures and encumbrances. And then the actual column, and you'll see in the revenues, 
the unfavorable the budget or the unfavorable variance I'm sorry in the restricted federal state and other programs those are programs like your title one your special ed um, what else is the big ones in there um, 21st century, century. Um, the PFY yeah. grant now the reason you <clears throat> usually run into a variance here is because sometimes the, the funding level may come through differently um, and it can be a timing difference if some of them run past year end they some go to September rather than cutting off at June 30 but in all cases with the the revenue and expenditures for those grants they equal out to zero so the the budget I guess on that is not as authoritative as it is with uh, the regular general fund right and for and general word. right and <laughs> generally um, we try to make sure that we budget on the high side as far as those restricted programs go in case there is a grant that that comes through that we didn't know about so that we don't have to go back through the whole process of getting approvals in order to be able to accept that grant and spend it so there's changes in your grants during the year, but she doesn't. Go, it's not necessary to go back <coughs> and change the budget for those. Right, and a lot of those grants that we were just talking about, the the special ed, the Title One, um, the 21st Century, they're two-year grants. So it may be you know the first year of the grant, and we either did or didn't spend as much as we thought we were going to. There's not as much to carry over into the second year, and that's that's what a lot of this difference was. Now, in the rest of the, the budget for the general operating budget that's not part of those restricted grant programs, you'll see there's there's a minimal variance in the revenues. There was only like 23000 in the state of Maryland funds, and in the other funds it was about 75000 And in case in the case of the other funds, those would be things like your, your uh, with kinship program, out-of-county tuition, um, facility rentals, bus rentals, and those tend to be budgeted low because you're not sure what they're going to come in, what level they'll come in at. Then in the expenditures, the out of the one and a half million uh, favorable variants, let's see, uh, one and a half million of that is not, is the regular operating budget. And out of the 556,000 for that, you see there's a variance there. There was a savings of 224000 in fixed charges. And that's been partially, mainly identified as due to staff attri attrition at the central office and the schools, and then the passage of HB uh, 1109, which impacted the retirement expenses. You received a credit on a fourth quarter billing on that. Right. We Where received is that? I can't. I'm trying to find that one. In uh, 48, on page 48? On page, page 48. The budget and actual. Oh, okay. 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 Yeah. And then under under expenditures and encumbrances, about halfway down the page, it's fixed charges. Oh, fixed charges. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. And that was that credit that we received at the end of last year. That it came out. Um, the legislature passed it late oh. in the year, mm -hmm. and we got one hundred and sixty-two thousand dollars right, right at the um, fourth quarter as part of the fixed charges and a retirement credit. And that's why there's money left in that account. And then I wasn't going to go into detail with the other variances because they were all less than 100000 but you, you all did a very good job of, of, you know, really keeping an eye on your expenditures and coming in under budget. And, I mean, I'm assuming you, you, you've, you've gone through the budget as you've made variances, but back on page 11 in the management's discussion and analysis, which is uh, written by Robin, there is discussion in there as to what the ver what the changes were in the budget, and it also shows your original budget, your final budget, where which which levels had additions, which levels had reductions, and what the net change was in that budget budgeted expenditure category. That it? And I'm happy to answer any questions. I was trying to keep it short and sweet. Well, there's a couple, <laughs> couple things that I want to point out to you. Um, we referred to page 44, or Joanne re referred to page 44, which was the fund balance page. Um, and I just want to point out that we have $817,000 that's unassigned at this point in time. In comparison to our unrestricted budget, which is a $90 million budget, we have less than 1% 
as a cushion. So if we have a extremely bad winter, fuel costs go up, those kinds of things, very quickly could this 1% or less than 1% go away. So I just want to make sure that, um, that you're aware of where we stand as far as the unrestricted fund balance goes. And other than that, if you have any questions, either of us will try to answer <laughs> them. <laughs> well, I would say great job uh, to, um, well, first off, to have positive audit, which is a lot of work. But the other one is to have that fund balance. Um, I know you're nervous about it being that small, but man, with that big a budget and then to have it almost almost right where it should be. I mean, that's good for the public to know, I think. And as she was saying, things like, you know, you know, fuel oil costs or, or gasoline costs, you just don't know. You, you have no idea and that's going to hit in the middle of your school year. So it, it's hard to be able to say, I'm going to set aside this amount for potential fuel changes, and then what happens if fuel costs actually go down, so then, yeah. Right. Well, you also indicated that there were several line items that were low, low balled. So when they come in in actual numbers, mm -hmm. this could be gone really quickly. It mm -hmm. can be. And I mean, and Mr. Pender will tell you, you know, one boiler or a compressor goes up in one of these schools, and you can be looking at a thirty or $40,000 cost very quickly, so. But it wasn't even that that was all of our low-balled items. We had quite a list of them. So that's very important to note. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. We'll move on to Bridge to Excellence Comprehensive Master Plan with Ms. Julia Alley, uh, Supervisor of Instruction for Visual and performing arts K through 12 media, online learning, service learning, and non-public schools and strategic planning. Mouthful. I did it. <laughs> she wears many hats. You're a busy lady. I try. <laughs> For the record, I am Julia Alley, and my office is known as World Languages and Media. So, and from that, I am bringing you the Bridge to Excellence Master Plan, which we are now so familiar with, <laughs> because we've done this, <coughs> for me, it's five years. But for anybody here who is new at this, and Grace, I know you from Mattapique Middle School back when I was there as an assistant principal, so it's nice to see your face. Um, and <laughs> nice to meet you, too. Nice to meet you, as well. <laughs> um, the Bridge to Excellence Master Plan is a state and federal requirement where essentially the goal of this document is to give a summary of how our students are doing on required tests. So that would be the park assessments or the HSA tests and things like that. It's really structured in three sections. The first section is the executive summary, which you should all have access to. And it introduces, gives a little overview of Queen Anne's County and our location and the number of students we have and, and our working force. Then we have a budget narrative, which um, comes from Ms. Landgraf's department. After that, we have a synopsis brief <coughs> summary of our goal progress, and we look at it through the lens of how different student groups are doing and achieving as compared to the aggregate group. So they compare different subgroups to the total number of students. And we're looking to try to make sure there is not a gap of 10% or more in these areas. And that would be for assessments like park math, park reading language arts, HSA biology, and government. Then the last thing is they talk about the assessments that we administer. And that would be county and local assessments that you would take. And it gives a, a brief synopsis as to why we have those tests, what we're trying to do with them. And that's usually to track achievement and to see where we need to address people's um, issues in different areas. 
after that. So that's all of section one. Section two is a repeat because the state of Maryland usually takes this whole document, pieces it up, gives it to different people to look at. So that's why it seems a little redundant is because we tell them what we're going to tell them and then we tell them it in more length. So we again go through the different areas that you're, you take those state tests, state and national tests. The last section has to do with the assessment requirements because the state has some new laws going out that are limiting the amount of time that students can be tested in school. I believe it's capped at two and a half percent of your time in school. So it's trying to get at what we give, how we developed it, why we're giving it, how do we address uh, individual <coughs> student needs who are taking it. So at this time, it is March draft. It is, I would say, 99% done. We are just waiting for a couple of figures to be clarified in the <coughs> financial section, but all of the other data is correct. So the only places where you'll, there may be slight changes are pages 11 and 12 that are highlighted for your convenience to find it. But other than that, it should be exactly what we're going to send into the state. So we're asking that it be accepted at this point to we'll bring it to the commissioners. They will look at it. We're presenting it to them. And then we will send it on to the state where they will review it and give us any feedback where they want to find out more information to clarify things. Are there any questions? <laughs> no, I've heard it a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm good. I'm good. I am. I'm fine. Yeah. Thanks for all your hard work on that. That's well, a big document. You. Yes, it's probably one of these best sellers that <laughs> <laughs> we'll never know. But thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank, thank you, you, Julia. Have a good evening. You too. Um, and at this time, Robin Landgraf, Director for Finance for the <laughs> Monthly Financial <coughs> Report. Okay, this is our standard monthly financial report. Um, again, I'm Robin Landgraf, the Finance Director. Um, you have three reports in front of you. One is numbered Report 1, which is a 30,000 foot view and basically just gives you um, a highlight of each of the categories in the budget. Then there's a Report 2 that gives you a little more detail. It breaks it down by what we call, in my department, the objects, salaries, contracts, um, supplies, and whatnot. And then the third document is kind of my overview and comments that I um, have made to you. And essentially in this report, there were two comments that I made, both of them having to do with special education. Um, one is you'll see that on that second report that there was a negative in contracted services. And we had to contract out some speech therapy and some psychological services this year because we were unable to find employees to hire. So we need to take that money and move it out of salaries into contracted services to cover those costs. So we will be doing that and you'll, you'll receive a in-category transfer of funds um, in the next month or so. The second item, um, and the one that's a little more scary to me, is non-public placements. Um, at this point in time, um, we, have, we are over on non-public placements to the tune of about $108,000. And I know that we have, I have one more cost sheet that I've just received this week. So it's probably gonna be close to $150,000 that we're gonna be over. And these are special ed students that are placed in a non-public setting um, in a different school because we're unable in the county to meet their needs. Um, some of these placements are pretty expensive. I think we have two that are over $100,000 um, each this year, so. That's a concern, and then to hand in hand with that is transportation costs to go along with that because we're now transporting students across the bridge, and I think we have six different um, schools that we're transporting students to, so we have buses that are going over there. So we'll be keeping an eye on those transportation costs, costs still. So um, if there are any questions, I'll be happy to 
try what to answer. What did we budget that? for for that? What did we budget for? So I mean, care. what do you use? Like three people, or the what you had last year? Or? Um, generally, we do what we had the previous year and last year. I think we had four that were going across. So we have two additional buses um, that are going across this year. Wow. How many total you have going over now? This year, we have how many going? Six? I think we have six in non-public placements this year. And we have to use two buses for that? Because of the timing of when the schools start and where they're located. Mm -hmm. um, I know Margaret Ellen's been working with other counties and trying to coordinate efforts and whatnot. Um, but so far, we've ended up having to hire additional staff in order to accommodate. Mm. Anyone else want to have a question? I was going to say, so the public understands, we never know when a student's going to move into our system who's already been qualified at the state level for special needs learning outside of the public system. So therefore, it is a very hard item to budget. We have a lot of people move in. We have a lot of people move out. Maybe one of our students currently enrolled will move out and another one will move in. But a worst case scenario is we could get five in a year that have already been verified as needing outside public school assistance. And that's our responsibility. We have to provide that education for those students. It's a very hard thing to um, judge. Okay, thank you, Robin. Uh, the next thing we have is a um, break. Does the board members want to take a break or keep on moving? I'm good. I'm good. Beverly, fine. Keep moving. All right. Next are the current action items for approval. And we will move to the HR report. I make a motion that we approve the HR report as presented in closed session. Second. Second. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. The ayes have it. Transportation report. Yes, we have um, three substitute bus drivers that have uh, met all of the qualifications. Uh, Mr. Linnell Copper, Ms. Oprah Dodd, Mr. Harold Reese, that we would like to have approved um, for this year, for 2017-18 school year. We also have um, a bus uh, replacement from Mr. Billy Willis is looking to replace bus 804 um, with a new bus. Uh, so we have three substitute bus drivers and then one bus replacement for Mr. Willis, which will be 804. Okay, I make a motion that um, we approve the three substitute bus drivers, Mr. Copper, Ms. Dodds, and Mr. Reese. Did I get that correct? Yes, ma'am. And also the bus replacement, 8004, with a new bus. That's correct. Second. I have a question though on that. What, it's, it's 15 year comes up at 2018. This particular bus uh, was owned by uh, Mr. Willis, who passed away, um, and that bus belongs to another person in the family so we need to replace that bus on um, on the route so that bus 8004 is going out of service um, another um, person owns that bus so we're having to replace that mr will mr willis's son is buying the bus though right i mean we're not buying it we're not no this is a pva for mr willis to buy a new bus 804 is going to um another <laughs> member in the family who is not going to be driving that bus for okay. the county anymore so there won't be two pvas for this one bus it's just one pva okay so we had a motion we had a second, a second. okay all in favor say aye 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 all opposed say no the ayes have it thank you I'm, can I just ask a question? We have on our paper, we have 9.03 as policies, final read, but on our online agenda, it is not, 9.03 is the CIP approval. Online agenda is, is missing the policies for the final read of school improvement. I'm gonna ask that we table that since we didn't get a chance to read it ahead of time. 
Yeah, I was wondering about that. Yep. Yeah. So I make a motion that we table the 9.03 policy school improvement final read. I second that. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. The ayes have it. <coughs> catch you. The next item on the agenda is the FY19 CIP. Mrs. Poland provided a presentation during the September 20th work session. They are now requesting re approval, sorry about that, of the FY 2019 submission package. Are there any questions or further discussion before I call for a motion? So may I have a, a motion to approve the FY 2019 CIP? So moved. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. The ayes have it. Thank you so much. <laughs> Was that easy? <laughs> that easy. Great yeah. <sighs> Thank you. Yeah, well, we're going to move on to the 10.05, the field trip, Queen Anne's County High School marching band to the 2017 Tournament of Bands Atlantic Coast Championship at Hershey Park Stadium. I make a motion that we approve the field trip for Queen Anne's County High School marching band 2017 Tournament of the Bands Atlantic Coast Championship at Hershey Park Stadium. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. The ayes have it. We are back to um, the citizen participation public comment again. Uh, do we have anyone out there that did not speak the first time around and would like to speak this time? Okay. So we're going to move on to future meetings and events. October 4th <coughs> through the 6th is the MAVE annual conference being held right now in Ocean City, Maryland. October 18th will be a work session at 11 a.m. October 18th will be the BPW construction presentation. We forgot the Board appeal on the 18th. Oh, thank you, because I was wondering what that was. Mm -hmm. Board of Public Works construction presentation, and that'll be held in Annapolis, Maryland. What were you saying? To the, there's an appeal in between those two. You missed. We're gonna, we're, we're, I thought we were going to do yeah, we're gonna, the paper. It's, not, it's on my paper. You. Oh, yours is on there. Yeah. Paper appeal. It's not it's uh, there's an appeal on the on October 18th. 4-205 appeal. There may be. There may be. There may be. There may be. Right. Okay. There may be. Um, could our council address this issue? <laughs> Please. All right. For the record, Darren Burns, uh, board council. Uh, I was just looking through your agenda and noting Ms. George's comment, too. I, I do see that. I see different items on the agenda and d numbered differently and sort of following up preliminarily on what Ms. DiMaggio read earlier about open meetings. I just think you want to continue Absolutely. to work on bringing these. I understand that the um, programs for, for setting the agendas on the, on the websites <laughs> vary from system to system, and it's just one of those ongoing processes. But at some point, you want it to be that whatever's put on the website in whatever format someone accesses it should generally be the same unless you change it in your agenda. Moving on from that, seeing that the October 18th reference is a work session and also the uh, construction presentation, I, I think you wanted me to comment on the, uh, the closed session appeal, correct? Yes. Right. My understanding is that was simply a, uh, you noted that as one of your reserved dates to conduct any appeal that was would be presented from the various avenues that either citizens, employees, students, parents may file an appeal. Um, the only thing you had on there was an appeal which I believe uh, has been moved to a paper appeal so that there would not be, unless you have another item to cover in the work session, that appeal would no longer require you to hold the session. Okay. Very good. Thank you, Darren. Thank you. And then on October 27th, we have Teacher of the Year Gala. And it's not in here, but I'm going to make a comment. 
On Friday the 13th of October, the Hispanic Heritage Dinner will be held at Sellersville Middle School from 6 o'clock p.m. to 8 o'clock p.m. And for you that may not know what that is, um, the Hispanic community comes together at um, Sellersville Middle School and creates a dinner for you to come out and enjoy. So I would advise you to do it. <laughs> um, is there anything else that anyone else wants to? What time did that start in that? I'm Six sorry? to eight p.m. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I'd just like to acknowledge uh, Mr. Eric Wright, who is the band director over at Queen Anne's High School and who uh, just so graciously worked with us as we planned for Bishop Taylor's um, homegoing service. And he had tournament of bands uh, <laughs> there all at the same time, several hundred people. And he and the administrators there really worked closely with us and the family. And I'd just like to acknowledge that. Thank I, you. I agree. Great job. That was, that was quite a... Mr. Uh, Pender did a... Excellent job. Too. Yes, he also did. Direction <laughs> yes. Sheriff's department, everybody yeah. worked together. Yeah, everybody that came together. It was a wonderful, um, it just, it, it all came very together smooth. very smoothly. We were all worried, but it came together. Mm -hmm. So um, at this time, I need a motion to adjourn the meeting. So moved. Second. All those in favor say aye. aye. All opposed aye. say no. The ayes have it. Thank you, and we will be back on the 18th for a work session.